Welcome back to another Centennial Tidbit, where we've been talking with individuals and organizations that have an affinity or tied to the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier and have been very helpful as we go through the centennial year to highlight the 100th anniversary of the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. Today, I have the very unique uh, opportunity to talk with Staff Sergeant Sarah Corey of the United States Army's Band, more commonly referred to as Pershing's Own, uh, about her very special musical composition called Journey Home. And Sarah, I'd like to welcome you to our tidbit. Thank you so much for having me. Ah. Can you um, start off by one, telling us uh, a little bit about yourself, how you came into the Army and, and how you ended up with the Army Band? Yeah, of course. So uh, I'm Staff Sergeant Sarah Corey, and I am a Staff Arranger. Um, I think my uh, journey to Pershing Zone was uh, a little different. Um, I was actually finishing my doctorate at the University of Colorado, and I took a class, and the uh, professor uh, asked us to look at jobs that we you know, could potentially want to do when we um, leave the university, and I saw that a staff arranger position was open with the army band and I was beyond excited. And so I actually ended up applying before I finished my degree. Um, the thing that kind of really cemented it for me was um, this like physical aspect. Um, I have both uh, Marines and Air Force in my family, my uh, grandfathers and uncles on both sides. And um, most of them are pilots. <laughs> so I was the one that uh, renegade and uh, ended up joining the army. Um, and then I found out that my job would be on Fort Myer, which is uh, where the um, uh, Arlington National Cemetery is and actually where my grandfather is buried. And it was really amazing when I actually came to do the interview, when I found out I made the interview. Um, I took the rest of the day and hung out with my grandfather and I brought him some flowers and we we hung out, so. That's really cool. Uh, <laughs> you'll have to forgive me, I'm an infantryman. What, <laughs> what does the duties of a staff rain, a ranger do for the army? Um, that's a great question. And um, so I'm, I'm in support, so I support the musicians. Um, I actually just finished up um, some arrangements for our ceremonial band. Um, basically what I do is I take music for one group of instruments, say a bunch of bassoons, and then I write it for a different group of instruments, maybe uh, strings. So I just finished up some hymns to honor some of our fallen soldiers um, during their, their ceremonies. So stuff like that. <laughs> So besides going renegade and not wanting to fly in airplanes, uh, <laughs> what drew you to the army band? Um, I've always been, uh, I've always really admired everything that they've done. Um, I've seen uh, them perform. I've seen a lot of their uh, different groups play um, and a lot of their materials um, either online or um uh, in person. And so I really just felt drawn to the army. <laughs> well, then let's, uh, let's talk about the journey home. Um, this is obviously a very special piece that I've heard more than once. And um, we've, we've talked previously about this. And I believe that we had approached the army band asking if someone could compose a special arrangement for the centennial of the tomb of the unknown soldier. And you picked up that banner and quite honestly have crushed it. But, um, you know, tell me about, uh, you know, what you kind of went through when this request comes down for this brand new piece. So when this request first came in, I was just beyond excited. And I have, I feel like I have a very deep connection um, to this and so I definitely wanted to get my hands on that and so the process is 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 d interesting <laughs> fumbling over my words here um the pro the process for me varies based on the piece and what the circumstances around it um are so I don't 
I'm not going to particularly write one composition um, the same as I write another one because the circumstances and the feeling and the emotion and everything that crafts it are so different. Um, I guess my process a little bit for this piece, just um, getting my head, wrapping my head around it. I talked with a lot of uh, people in the organization. I heard um, a lot of things that the mothers have said. I've heard a lot of things um, that are just really impactful. And so I kind of took that and I sat with it and I went to the tomb and I watched the changing of the guards. I watched the sunrise. I watched the sunset over the area and really tried to get in that space and really absorb what embodies that and tried to translate that into music. <laughs> Uh, and, and how you do that is amazing. I'm not going to lie. Uh, I can't even imagine having to capture something like that and then transition it into music. So I, I'm assuming that you took some of your experiences with your family members who served in, into this piece as well. Um, mm -hmm. How <laughs> This is going to sound weird, but how do you take that emotion and put it into music? Uh, that's a great question. Yeah. So my family um, is one of the other kind of um, my grandfather in, in particular, since he's at at the, at Arlington, um, did play a big role in it, too, because that's um, how close I can get um, feeling that emotion uh, personally. And like, I know where he is and there's a lot of people who don't. Um, and so that really hits me. Um, really hard and really deep. And so um, taking that emotion and translating it into music is interesting and a very, it, kind of what I've been trained for for a long time. So there are different types of combinations of harmonies and of instruments that can give you these kinds of feelings. So there were a couple of things that I wanted to kind of gravitate towards um, immediately. So like I like to use the solo trumpet has a solo trumpet line that kind of um, harkens back to, you know, taps, right? Um, I mean, not musically exactly, but it can kind of echo that just by using that one particular instrument and that can evoke um, those kinds of emotions. And then there's also some like harmonic language um, shifts from certain major to minor chords um, that can also give that kind of proud, um, but also solemn uh, kind of tone that pins the piece together. Okay. Uh, you know, I'm the guy that always loved John Philip Sousa. I, I you know, I, I played trumpet when I was in high school until I, I couldn't anymore. And, you know, I never carried it on after that. But I've always liked crisp powerful horn music and you've captured that in this you did you definitely drew my attention immediately and I really love listening to the combinations and the harmonies and the, and the changes that you have of it. Um, it it really does when you sit and listen to it and close your eyes you can see this difficult journey home of the unknown soldier and 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 quite honestly it's not just the unknown soldier I don't think I don't want to put words into your mouth but I think that anyone that has a difficult journey home from a battlefield, this kind of captures a little bit of what they may go through. Uh, what 100. did you start with? I mean, when, when you put the paper down for the very first time, what was the first thing that you put onto the paper? Where, where, what section did you, you know, that, that, that was the linchpin for all of this? What did I start with? Well, first off, I do want to say that, yeah, it does embody that journey home for everyone. And I do, I do want to say that that does speak truth for me and for the piece. Um, and so what did I start with? <laughs> um, I want to say I started with that solo trumpet line. Um, and that was kind of the basis for the whole piece, because uh, I remember taps so clearly on that rainy day. And I wanted something to embody that feeling. And I wanted that solo line, um, which it starts off with and, and the snare, um, the ceremonial snare. So it sounds very, very ceremonial. And it's like kind of like one person that's going through like, yeah, that journey. And then all the other instruments kind of come in and support it and um, 
you know, uh, change it in different ways. And um, yeah, so I started with that. And then I think after that, I kind of went to this, uh, that I also had a portal shift that I really liked and it really embodied like this um, sense of like service and like kind of sacrifice that I wanted to to put throughout the piece. So I guess I started with the trumpet line and a little bit of portal um, structure. So, and I knew how I wanted to start it and you know, I wanted how to exactly how I wanted to end it. And oh. those were the first two things on the page. <laughs> okay. And how long did the process take? I mean, as you're, you're, you're taking an instrument, you're working it in, you're finding where it fits from start to finish. How long did it take you to, to put this on paper? So it's a good question. I actually really took my time with this piece um, because I felt like that was what was necessary and what was needed to really honor, honor the memories. And I think it probably took maybe about a month um, or more. And the thing is I did do a lot of research and a lot of speaking with people and hearing people's stories and again visiting like before that process started so that what we call pre-composition <laughs> um actually i feel like takes the most time um so like the actual writing of the piece may not take as long but it's kind of the research and the um the storytelling and getting into the headspace and all of that that actually takes the longest i feel and did you i know that originally you had sent us a um, preview of it and it was yeah. on a computer so obviously it we can hear the music but we can't hear it as it as it's meant to be played um is that what you use to you know capture it as you're working through the process or did you put that in later on so that's a really good question um so what I gave you guys was a MIDI file. So we use that. Um, I normally only use that to check if there are any mistakes or anything really quickly. Um, I actually don't use uh, MIDI playback during um, during the composition process because I feel like it um, can box you into kind of a hole sometimes because the computer can make a whole bunch of sounds that a real instrument can't. So like uh, there's some trills in the clarinet that you can just slap into finale and it'll play it back and but but they're not possible or they don't sound good or um and generally it sounds better in my head <laughs> than it does on paper but that's just you know uh, I've spent decades looking at music and hearing it in in my head um so typically when um other people ask me for what we call a mock-up which is kind of what I sent out um, not everyone can hear hear the music in their head um, so I, I will generally send out a MIDI file to um, people just so that they can have a, a, an idea of, of what it is, but it definitely is just a, like a 2D rendering of what it actually will be. So like when, um, when you actually hear it in real life, hopefully it'll be, you know, it's normally a lot better <laughs> from the really amazing musicians, so. And, and it was fun because when we got that, um listening to it and understanding it's you know just a computer generated it was still powerful it still evoked emotions from the, the few of us that had the opportunity to hear it prior to that um is one thing where i could close my eyes again and feel what you had tried to capture and i and i couldn't wait to hear what it was like coming from the right instruments and the right players and and so you know when you were done at what point did you put it in front of those musicians and say let's hear it what point oh you mean like when did I feel like the piece was done yeah when That's when could you actually place that paperwork in front of a musician and say I want to hear this played and then you know how did how did that process go from from listening to it up here to listening to it really be played so I don't think the piece has been performed in its entirety yet um I think that's waiting for the premiere um but I guess the question, um, if I can just uh, rephrase it, I think, so the question is like, what are the differences between like what I hear and how it actually, what, what my expectations of it were in front of the musician and then like actually hearing it. Okay, so um, 
a lot of times what I hear in my head is fairly accurate. <laughs> um, so I have an idea of what it's going to sound like, but the actual feeling and the impact of hearing it um, and having the, the sound waves jiggle like inside your ear um, and actually feeling those vibrations is a whole nother experience. So I really enjoy that experience. Um, normally like the nuts and bolts are already in my head and they're already, they're already there. <laughs> but um, I don't think much can, I don't think there's like a lot of things that can really compare to actually like hearing your art or your piece when you're done with it. Um, music is a weird medium that way. Because <laughs> normally if you paint something, it's, it's there, right? I mean, obviously you can conceptualize it in your head afterwards, but then you have a physical object um, that you can like look back on or look to and, and it's, it exists there in space and music only exists, you know, as a sound waves only when you, when you make it or, you know, after it's been recorded, <laughs> which would be, I guess, that kind of process. Um, but yeah, music is an interesting creature that way. <laughs> okay. So uh, I know that there is a piece out there or at least a section of it out there for people to hear a bit. And when was the first time you heard that played? Um, the first time I heard it played was on YouTube. I didn't really? get to hear it in person um, for the recording. So um, things move so fast here. And, um, and so like I, I was not present at the recording, but they did a fabulous job and getting to hear it, I put on my really nice headphones and I got to listen to it and it was still really impactful, so. Okay, and obviously it came out to be what, what you were looking for. Um, exactly. And that's just a bit of it uh, that the public can see. And, and so the whole thing hasn't been played fully yet. Um, Not yet. When do you think that's going to occur? Um, I, I do not know. <laughs> um, I just write the music. Uh, I don't command the forces. So um, I am really excited to hear it when it is performed. Okay. Is it your design when you um, sit down and write something like this? Obviously, you're 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 working for the army band, so that's the um, professionals that you're designing things for. But do you ever have an intent that whatever you write is also something that maybe that high school band could play, or 
uh, another band other than the U.S. Army band. Is, is that is that part of the process when you put these down on paper? Yes, of course. That's always part of the process. You always want to consider who you're writing for and um, who is going to be performing, where it's going to be performed, um, what forces are going to be performing it. Um, and with this piece, I kind of made it a little bit um, more accessible. So yeah, other people should be able to perform it as well. So it's not um, something that's incredibly difficult, but it's incredibly powerful um, and it should be fairly accessible. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, thank you for taking the time to talk about this. I'm going to uh, look forward to when it actually gets done up in its entirety. I think it's just going to be amazing because what you've already done is amazing. Um, and I will uh, definitely promote it <laughs> and tell anybody to listen to your work because uh, what you've done uh, from the little bit that we asked, um, it, again, is amazing. I think everyone should enjoy this. Uh, and hopefully during the centennial um, around November 11th or leading up to it, we'll get to hear mm -hmm. the full thing. So thank you, Sarah, for taking the time today to talk to me about this. No problem. Thank you so much for having me. And it means the world to me that you guys enjoy my piece. Oh, well, <laughs> again, I'm an infantryman, so you're a rock star to me. Uh, being able to create that stuff in your mind and put it on paper is just truly amazing. So. Uh, good luck with everything. I know you'll be busy for the rest of the year. Um, and we hopefully look forward to talking to you again when it does come out in uh, its entirety. Of course. Okay.